The Library of Babel is a concept that has always fascinated me. The idea of a place being infinite could be a parody of the human experience and universe itself. Imagine a dimension or place where every piece of knowledge was possible. And I mean everything. Every word, sentence, and paragraph that ever was, can or could be. It exists somewhere somewhere in this infinite landscape. That being said, you would be able to find out what happened to Amelia Earhart, or a manuscript of every single word you have ever said, or the most secret document of the FBI. At this point, I think you get it. The Library of Babel is a story written by George Luis Borges in 1941. Originally written in Spanish, the narrator of the story notes how this dimension is endless and made up of adjacent hexagonal rooms. Each of these rooms, there is an entrance on one wall, the bare necessities of human survival on another wall, which is starting to sound a lot like the back rooms, and four walls of bookshelves. The order of content, however, on these books are random, and the story it does describe that inhabitants of the library believe that the books contain all possible order sequences of the alphabet and numbers, including other symbols such as the period, the comma, and the space. As complex as the world is, it could explain the universe's complexity in all its finest detail. In theory, this could exist, but it sounds like it would be beneficial to be able to have a place where every piece of knowledge could be found. But here's the catch. I mean, it probably wouldn't be. Unless there was a system that could organize an infinite amount of knowledgeable truths versus abstraction or false information, assuming that would even be possible in the first place with an infinite amount of books, but why would this even be the case? I think the answer is simple. There's just too much of it. If we imagine everything or anything possible, most of the wording would just be gibberish and incomprehensible language. If we go to the official website for the Library of Babel, we have eight different sections of pages that we can choose from. When you hover your mouse over a word, they erratically change symbols on the last two digits of the word. I will be discussing each section of the website and the significance and reasons for the structure of this book and concepts that follow the paradox that come with it. In the browse section, the library offers a list of symbols of ordinance, starting from the number zero, going to the value of nine. So instead of 10, the next value would actually be an A and B then C all the way to Z, and once reaching Z, starting with zero and repeating. This makes the system a base 36 system because it has 36 characters to represent each digit. So the system acts as more of an integer value rather than actual words. The only significance I believe this has to the word having value to it is by the connection of the real world, but only the word existing in itself. These are the sections you will find of the hexagonal areas that will lead you to the book section you are finding. In the real world, libraries are divided by numbers or by genre in the same way. If we click on any of the symbols on the list down below, if we see zero, it will bring you to a room that is described like it is in the book. There are four walls that you can choose from. When chosen, there are now five shelves you can select from, each shelf having 32 volumes. When I click on a single book, you will be shown a slide of 410 pages for this book. On the first page, it contains the title of the book and the rest of the book, each page being complete and utter meaningless combinations of letters, or at least it most likely will be, with the extremely small chance of there being a comprehensible sentence or word. The chances of you finding these though are so low that it would take several lifetimes in order to achieve such a task. The true concept and idea of infinity needs finiteness in order for it to exist in some form or another. This is why each book is only restricted to 410 pages instead of an infinite amount of them, because then there would be no reason to end the book. Under the five selections, Englishize will highlight words and phrases that exist or could be a word. For example, in quote, all English words of three or more letters are highlighted above. Hover over overlapping green words for analysis. When I kept clicking on the next page, I noticed a consistent pattern of total words ranging between 150 and 250 distinguishable words. It was always that I would never find a page above or below this amount. You can also bookmark the page and download it, although I don't know why you'd want to do that. Every book in the library looks identical to each other and you would just be downloading essentially gibberish, most likely. The only way you could truly find a book is by the name of its title. 
and even then it's not much more help than before. In the story, it is said that the original manuscript of symbols has neither numbers nor capital letters. This is interesting because the punctuation is limited to the comma and the period, plus space and the 22 letters of the alphabet are the 25 symbols that the narrator is referring to. Other than that, there is not much known about why it only contains 25 symbols, because as the Spanish alphabet has 27 letters in its alphabet that the book was written in, and the English language only having 26 letters, because we never actually see the book of the Library of Babel, so we can only imagine their randomness and what the actual symbols would look like. Hence, a fictional language could be being suggested here. This is where you will find the contents of words, sentences, and paragraphs inside of the book. You are able to enter up to 3,200 characters into the text box. That's a lot. However, the library only contains the lowercase letters and symbols. Not to be confused with the 25 characters before. This actually is in English, so you can type in English because this website was made for English characters. If we type my name Connor, for example, into the text box, there's a list of different matchings. Many, many matchings. The exact match will show the page with only the words that you have typed onto it. Other books can include randomized configurations of letters or randomized English words, and the last being the title of the books themselves. It is interesting that certain pages have completely illiterate words, commas, and periods, while other books are still randomized but have comprehensible words that exist in the English language. It's like there's this division between incomprehensible and somewhat comprehensible, as you would for an abstract painting and a realistic painting, that there's some semblance, there is some meaning, but not enough that we can make a full representation and accuracy of reality. In the book, the people inside of the library debate whether or not the library is endless, or if it is only confined to our perception of a limitless space, such as the universe that we live in. We don't actually know if it's infinite or not. There's always that speculation. The triangle or pentagonal shape is inconceivable, and that geometric pattern of the hexagon is of reason to the library. This is the logic that forms the structure that can be repeated indefinitely amongst itself. The mystics of the library make the claim of a circular book in a chamber that encloses the library like a capsule lined with books on all sides but much larger. As you can see in this image there is a globe of some kind but I speculate if that's the book they're talking about. There's also an identical miscolored version of the same sphere on the opposite end. The book is the center. End quote. The library is a sphere whose exact center is any hexagon and whose circumference is unattainable. When reading the rest of the story, much of the wording and phrasing of the book is vague, and I believe this allows for interpretation of the true nature of the library. The narrator is a separate being from the writer himself, like a protagonist is written by a fantasy writer. Random is self-explanatory. This is where you will find a random book and random title. It's as random as you can possibly get with anything. Every time you click on it and go back, the page refreshes and becomes different. This whole page will give you an idea of just how much there truly is to the library, that you will never overlap a single page twice. In some completely random location of the library, somewhere so vast, even though these pages are random, to quote on Wikipedia, each book marked by a coordinate corresponding to its place on the hexagonal library. So think of it as in your Minecraft world, you have numbers to represent where it is, but in this sense, it's the base 36 system. Hexagon name, wall number, shelf number, and book name, so that every book can be found at the same place every single time. This shows that there is a catalog for it and that it does exist. However, this website is said to contain all possible pages of 3,200 characters. That's about 10 to the 4,677 books. This number is so unfathomably large that it will completely dwarf many, many other large numbers. And I seriously don't think you understand how large this is. Let's go to a 
known example of a very large number and put this into scale. It is recognized by most scientists today that there is somewhere between 10 to the 78 and 10 to the 83 atoms in the observable universe. There could be more, but just putting that into perspective, that is a much smaller number than the number of books in the library. That's insane. Meaning, there is more books in the library than there are atoms in the observable universe. Another example, even bigger, Google, not the website, but the number Google, is 10 to the power of 100, which is still barely larger in terms of these massive scales. The book describes a conflict between the people that reside in the library and their beliefs on what should be done with the books. Some want to destroy the meaningless books while others want to preserve the books. We are only given context by the narrator, who is an unnamed and elderly man. While reading the story coincidentally in my college library, it made me think about how experience, just as and if not more important than we could ever even imagine through reading books even though they are both equally important. I think a part of life is balancing those two things out. No matter how much we read, our experience of the world cannot be complete without seeing such an environment for yourself. When you travel to a new country, it's like a brand new experience you have never seen before. New people, new culture, new food, language, communication are now alien and need to be adjusted to all over again. The difference being, this time you have experience of the world and can take that newfound experience and turn it into wisdom for your future. But in the case of the library, we could metaphorically compare it to staying in your own thoughts or lack of external contact with the outside world. Ignorance is now born. Now being ignorant in itself is neither bad or harmful, but we are all ignorant of almost every aspect of life, not including small areas of understanding which, as a society, we use together for greater understanding. This is how we've survived as a species and how we've continued our race over thousands of years. In the book, the purifiers are librarians who believe that the meaningless books need to be destroyed, while other librarians had distaste for the purifiers burning and destroying the books and throwing them. But when ignorance becomes a tool, and turns lack of understanding into a weapon. Deliberate ignorance is agnotology. What is this, you may ask? This is where many problems of our world suffice. When we can't find meaning in something, or we cannot understand it by deliberately choosing to resist learning, induced ignorance is used to influence the opinion of the masses and led by deliberate disinformation. That being said, I think now how I interpret this section of the story talking about the purifiers is replicating history, such as hate and war and fighting over the meanings that we can't discern. Another section of this website acts as its own piece. The idea of infinity is still prevalent here, but let's envision a different scenario. This time we are given the visual aspect, the universal slideshow takes into accordance. Every few seconds displays an image with the dimensions of 416 by 640 pixels with a combination of 4096 colors. This is somewhat basic, but you may have noticed that 4096 is a multiplicant of two as because this is the standard way of binary for a computer. If we consider the total amount of pixel dimensions of X and Y, which amount to the total of 4096 to the power of 266,240, not the number 266,000, but the, the power. That's how many digits there are to this. This number will result in every possible image ever in the confined dimension. Even this is much larger than the amount of books that the library has to offer. The slideshow actually just puts that to shame at this point. The universal slideshow with this context now is a slideshow of, you know, literally everything. I mean, almost everything. It is the slideshow of everything that can, will, and could be. In theory, you could sit here and after some time, find an image of you sitting at your phone or computer looking directly at the image right back at you. And you think it stops there? You could also find a picture of a map of the United States, or heck, the original backroom subreddit photo, or Vincent van Gogh's Starry Night. But the same problem rises. No matter how much you would sit here, you will never find anything remarkable besides an abstract bundle of pixels. At least, that's what should happen. Most would be meaningless static dust, 
but you could also upload your own image file and the image search, and a very similar rendition of the exact image will show up in the catalog. I shouldn't say exact because there are a very slight difference because there aren't as many colors being used here, but it's still pretty amazing that your image already exists. No matter what image you upload, it exists somewhere. Even every image you create on AI already existed on this website way before AI images became a thing. That's crazy to think about because it creates this paradox. If you think you've already created something, it's already been created. And I don't mean maybe, I mean it has been. Even a photo of your future exists here. Not exactly identical, but an image that is an almost perfect replica of the file that you upload. So keep that in mind when you try to upload your own file. When I tried to copy and paste the numbers of the exact image copy in the catalog, I, I simply couldn't. It was way too large. When I attempted to put it onto a document, it quite literally almost crashed my computer completely, so I do not recommend doing this. At this point, you may be asking, and I was asking myself this, what is the point of all this? Why create something so large that it cannot even be reasonably handled with? In terms, I don't think it has one definition or one purpose to it. It has any purpose that you can put into it. I think there is an inherent meaning between something that is finite and something that is infinite. Meaning, there is inherent meaning in everything. Even the things in your Minecraft world look like they never end. You just keep going and going on your flat world or your creative world when you're flying. But even an endless Minecraft world ends. Even the things that do seem endless are finite. The insane mass of a star or the insane lifetime of a black hole. They eventually die. They are just so huge, they seem infinite. And they might as well be. As humans, we value, however, what is finite. The art of an artist cannot be replicated by another individual or by an AI like that person can. And even if someone could do it a million times over or print it a million times over, it is not the original piece. There's only one true original work of art. That is what makes it finite. Some people have been able to find extremely slight variations and differences in the pixels with groups of color or in rare instances a visible pattern. And you know what, I challenge you as the viewer to find such an image. The last section of the website I will be talking about is the creator's thoughts and his written ideas and theories of why the library is the way it is. The writer starts off explaining how his interpretation of the book has changed while discussing and trying to understand the hexagonal shape and architecture of the identical rooms inside the library. When the writer found the original version of the book, the only main difference being two words. Each hexagonal contained 25 rows of books and five bookshelves, each covering the walls. This would completely change the layout of the library entirely, and there would only be one opening, and it would go in and out of that same area. The only physical way to continue through the library would be to have an opening in the fifth wall that could close, a, a secret door, for, you could say. But the text was changed because of Borges' error in the book, Instead of 25, there are now 20 total rows of books and four bookshelves, each containing five rows of 32, with now a total of 160 per bookshelf. As you can see in the diagram here, the writer explains that the only way you could travel with even just two openings is you could only go forward and back forever. Even changing the rotation of the wall still results in the same motion. So how would this place be possible to roam? I mean, is there a dimension higher than the third dimension involved here? Because that gets into totally other ideas. It is plausible, but, or as the writer's hexagon theory states it, it could be an error. Simply as that put it. But we can always wonder. There is the consideration of the spiral staircase and the artwork and the games that have depicted the library, but I believe neither to be a complete one-to-one -one replica. Even the drawings, I think, only give us a, a representation of what these spatially impossible areas could be. You know, it, it sort of reminds me of The Carpet and The Shining. I think Stanley Kubrick knew what he was doing, and we could also say that there was inspiration. The fact that a lot of the layout in The Shining doesn't 
really make sense that you find windows in places where there shouldn't be or hotel door rooms and places that are too small to contain that area and even bigger the hexagon pattern of the carpet that are the same over and over again the solution the writer proves later on is not much more helpful and i can't really blame him it explains that even if we were to somehow create a system that could turn and spiral to reach the inside of the chamber, you would never be able to actually reach the outside. And hence, if you were on the outside of the chamber, you would never be able to reach the inside. You would forever be trapped in a cycle. So even the solution of two openings in the third map layout that can join at its central point will make the two paths spiral out into infinity and never meet their paths ever again unless one path ends and the other continues allowing for an opening for that side of the path. But due to the nature of the library as described by Borges, an opening with an end would literally break this logic. The point that I am getting at is the book is described as the corridor chambers having two openings on each side. While four sides have books, the solution of geometry provided to solve this issue make the idea in itself a major paradox. This is not the first paradox I have come across within this whole story, and that is why I find it so fascinating and why I can put so much thought into it. How can two things be so synonymous to each other? Heck, how can two paradoxes be so synonymous to each other? The second part of the theory of why hexagons become much more philosophical, getting into the ideas and similarities between humans and bees. Before I knew about this discussion on my ride of research, I most likely uncoincidentally was thinking about how beehives work in a similar way to the library when I was looking at this book. Well, I wasn't looking at the book, I was looking at the images provided to explain this book visually. The libraries are beehives that possess value and the books within the hexagon-like chambers as if a bee would produce honey and a man would with words on paper, just in the metaphorical comparison. To put it simply, bees are a complex social species of insect that rely on their social interaction with one another and survival. In the same way that humans do, we need each other to survive, but we also have huge amounts of insights and we use our different skills in order to grow society. That's why we have many different fields and it's an interconnecting circle or, or web that benefits us all, at least in theory. I can see the inspiration because many philosophers have compared humans to bees in the sense for similarities and reasons described in the Y hexagon theory by this writer. That being said, there's a lot of ideas on here that you can check out and see for yourself. I did not mention the article linked to the Tower of Babel or the 40 minute lecture video and the Paris Review report etc, but these are other options available on this website, so they also provide a ton of insight for this entire story. The only true character we can get reference to about this story is the unnamed protagonist. He is fascinated by the library and tells the reader about its existence. He believes the library to be a vault or respiratory of all truths of existence and the entire universe. The accountant that holds every depiction of knowledge ever in a specific place at a specific time. Despite what the other librarians make of it, the narrator believes that the library has all of the knowledge in the universe. Even if we cannot understand it or grasp the ideas or concepts we have not learned or understand, there is inherent meaning in everything even if it seems abstract. You know why there are thousands of religions that exist in the world, or why all our beliefs are varied, that none of us have the exact same perspective? We are all right now, in our own sense, in our own worlds. But the warning of the narrator at the end, I think is clear. He wants to make sure that this explanation for everything that possibly can, could, or will ever be, can satisfy our lack of knowledge in the bigger picture. As a true believer, he wants to remind us of the possibilities of infinity and to make meaning out of the finiteness we have inside of it. Our lives, our family, and our passions are short-lived. Despite his concern that humanity may die if we stay narrow-minded, only leaving the library. So be open-minded and remember that the library has all the answers that you need. Thank you.